chairing this session and also giving a talk. And the order of the speakers is going to be changed just slightly. I'm listed as the last speaker. I'm going to be the first speaker, and then the order will be the same otherwise. And um, the reason I'm changing that is that I stuck my presentation in just as a placeholder in case one of the others didn't show up. But they all showed up, fortunately. Um, and furthermore, it um, facilitated my intention for my um, semi-paper, which is to give an overview of the uh, session and an overview of the book on which the session is based. Um, this is the third book in a series, or the presenters are presenting uh, information related to chapters in the book, and the book is, is on alleviating world suffering, um, and if it will look like this red one here on the screen, it will say alleviating world suffering instead of just world suffering. And um, it will be a kind of companion to this one in that this first book was about world suffering. Uh, my grandfather uh, went to China a hundred years ago and took a job for the, with commercial press, the biggest press in Asia at the time. And he's listed in the encyclopedia for the press as having brought colored printing to China. Well, I am, uh, I'm told, famous for bringing suffering to Isqual's. <laughs> I'm bringing suffering to the quality of life by emphasizing the negative component of uh, well-being uh, and, uh, and quality of life. And, and uh, I argue that it's been neglected and, and it's useful to, to emphasize that as well as the positive. Uh, so the, uh, the new book, which will come out next year, uh, uh, presumably in the spring, um, We'll have about 30 chapters, like the original book on world suffering. And this is how I made it work. Uh, I sent out invitations to about 100 researchers based upon literature review and listening to uh, people at conferences and inviting people that had done research related to alleviating world suffering to um, submit a, an abstract and to write a chapter. Uh, 60 people agreed to work on a chapter. I got 40 chapter proposals. Um, 16 chapters have been finalized, and about 15 are still in, in progress. Um, about uh, 10 to 20 of, of, of the papers, either uh, they, the author dropped out or I rejected the papers. Um, the completion date for all of the chapters is November, which is two months away and uh, publication next year. This is uh, an overview of the table of contents, giving the eight parts that I uh, identified, perspectives or uh, basic concepts, uh, quality of life research, part two, part three, um, personal and social caring, and four, switching to the macro level, world development, relief and recovery, and then staying at that macro level, um, a section on health and violence and human rights and finally uh, future suffering, preventing future suffering. Uh, I will show you uh, each of these sections in greater detail. These are tentatively the titles of each chapter in each section and uh, as you can see in the first section I am uh, leading with a chapter toward a paradigm of global suffering alleviation, and then there are several other um, uh, foundational uh, chapters. And then in the next section on, on quality of life research, uh, Joe Sergi uh, is listed, and he's going to be a presenter today, and then um, an economist, and uh, Ken Lam and Vicki Lam will do a lot of research on quality of life, and, and child will be, will be giving a chat have a chapter. And the third section will have, um, will emphasize personal and social caring, or the individual level, 
and Rhonda Phillips will be presenting uh, her, her uh, uh, chapter or, or presenting material from, from her chapter. Following that is a, a section on, on, as I said, macro level uh, global development, disaster recovery, and, and so forth. Uh, the fifth and sixth sections are likewise at this global macro level on health and violence, respectively. Uh, well, one thing I should note, and that one of the chapters there, the last one on the page is, is, is by Richard Estes, who was here and, and one of the founding fathers of this organization. And he has a ch chapter on uh, sexual exploitation of children. Uh, then the last two um, sections are on human rights, dignity, and justice, and finally uh, preventing future suffering. And in that section, uh, I, he Won Kwan uh, will be giving uh, her presentation on altruistic values of self and, and in group. And then I'll be talking about, uh, well, I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, I'm not going to have another presentation, uh, but I will have a concluding chapter. And in the concluding chapter, I'm planning to emphasize the future and, and prevention of suffering in the future. And, and I think, uh, and, and well, what I also will encourage is, is for quality of life research to, to take the future into account more in, in research that it's doing. Um, and I'm going to focus that future emphasis around environmental concerns uh, and climate change in particular. Uh, the the um, paradigm that I'm going to uh, outline in the first chapter uh, begins by saying, despite global economic growth, global suffering is rising fast as, as well. And, and, and uh, so it seems like Perhaps we can design a gross domestic suffering index. It might be useful to think about that, just like it's been useful to think about gross national happiness indicators. Uh, then I will ask, what are the types of suffering from a global policy standpoint? Uh, and, and in that domain, I have armed conflict, disaster, displacement, extreme poverty, starvation, violence, illness, social humiliation, in social suffering, hopelessness, and then I'll, I'll look at the severity of each type and then what types of things can be done about it. But now if we switch from this global level to a, a individual or micro level, um, the typology of suffering that we've been using uh, in, in writing about suffering so far um, is uh, the, the four types, physical, mental, which includes emotional, interpersonal, which is uh, uh, family and, and, and close uh, personal relations, and then social suffering, which is societal or s institutional stigmas and discrimination based. So racism was a good example of social suffering. But if going back to that previous slide, uh, see the difference in types of suffering, if you move to the global level, uh, gets at policy. Issue. So, so the book is going to emphasize policy a lot, but it's also emphasizing the individual level of suffering and also what the individual can and cannot do to deal with uh, personal suffering. One of the things I'm going to have in this first chapter is, is something like this decision tree, which, which starts with uh, identifying personal values and moving to ask the questions about the types of values, and then finally looking at how those values relate to uh, individual types of suffering. At the bottom, there are, are things that can be done to uh, alleviate suffering. Uh, this is something I just thought I'd show. It's an it's a ecosystem, social ecosystem model that, we'll, that I'll have in the last chapter because it emphasizes future so much. Um, finally, the, some miscellaneous observations regarding alleviation of world suffering. First, the top priority for alleviation of world suffering includes eradicating structural obstacles like inequality, deep poverty, and overpopulation. Secondly, social suffering, 
for example, humiliated refugees, without relief leads to violent conflict. The same is true with racism and, and serious, other serious types of social suffering. And finally, unalleviated suffering stems largely from uh, self-interest, drive for power, lack of empathy, loss of civil society, and beliefs that suffering builds character. So I'm including both individual, as you can see, and macro level considerations. Uh, and uh, that's it. I'll entertain one or two brief questions before we move on. But feel free not to ask any questions. Um, the, the first presenter will be, uh, I believe, Rhonda Phillips. You're listed in the, the first in the program, right? Uh, she and her colleague from Turkey and Purdue uh, uh, have been working on caring economics, and she will find her, her PowerPoint and uh, talk on that. Uh, she, incidentally, is as you almost certainly know, the, not the president, but the, or, or are you the president? The president. Uh, Ms. Qualls, and she's been a very effective leader for the past three years, and she's also written uh, or edited 18 books, and she's dean of the Honors College at Purdue. So we're lucky to have uh, her as our distinguished first speaker. I want to say thanks to Ron because his work in suffering and pushing that forward is really uh, revolutionary in many ways. And there are many people that prefer not to talk about it, and they prefer to. This one is not the corrected version. This is um, the one I had worked and worked and worked on and then found out that it's not on my flash drive. So you're getting the, uh, the 1.0 version instead of the polished finished version, but so, so be it. But anyway, I just wanted to say thank you to Ron because he has done so much in pushing forward on us thinking about suffering and really changing our perspectives on how we look at quality of life and well-being across a lot of dimensions. Uh, my background is in um, community development, urban regional planning, economics, and so I spend a lot of time thinking about how can we make our economic systems better, our, and that of course has implications for our social and, and beyond um, domains. And so um, I have a colleague, um, Ahmet, uh, who wanted to be here but could not, and he is, I've known him for years, he's now a visiting uh, professor at Purdue, and he and his, um, his spouse, who is also a visiting professor, went back to Turkey uh, to visit family after a year at Purdue, arrived in the middle of the coup. And it was just really stressful and really drove home um, why we need to have systems that care more about people and those elements rather than just uh, things that sometimes can't even be explained. And so it, it was really tough. Uh, he, they did get out, they came back. He was allowed out, but not his family. And then finally they were allowed back in. So we're relieved to have them back at Purdue for another year. <laughs> And uh, anyway, it really, really, uh, I guess, uh, flavored the perspectives of some of the stuff you'll see in our presentation. And I'm presenting on his behalf since he couldn't join us today. Let's see. I guess I'll just do it this way. Anyway, um, I knew that was going to happen. I'm so sorry, I'm out of pocket. <laughs> Let's see if we can do it this way. I tend to move a lot when I talk, so I'll try to be very still and talk to you. Um, we wanted to look at ideas around this uh, caring economics. In other words, can you build in aspects into economic systems 
that look at the human dimensions more so than the traditional market-based systems do. And so we wanted to um, look at a couple things. One is the values around caring, and then we wanted to look at um, what that means for market-based economy. Now, Mehmet is, is very into this idea that market-based uh, economic models are, you know, if we look at the negative aspects of it, it really is all about the self-interest guided by um, utilitarian interest and also um, a lot of destruction and greed and, and can lead to suffering. Uh, I tend to have a, a little bit more moderate perspective in that I think there still can be some changes to market-based economic systems that we can make it more compassionate and empathetic and move forward um, without tossing out the whole system. But anyway, you'll, you'll get the flavor of that as we go through. Um, there are all sorts of suffering that are caused uh, by market-based economics, and again, we quote some of Ryan's work there, um, including physical, mental, uh, social suffering, and they can be all sort of things, from the very individual in terms of uh, losing work or not having work that is fulfilling, and gender inequality that is rampant throughout the world in many countries, including the U.S., where women still only uh, make about three quarters of what men make for the same jobs, which still hard to believe, but it happens. And um, so it, it runs both from the individual to the effects on society, both at the family level and community level, when things aren't right in the economic system, and it's directly impactful. So what's this idea of caring economics? Um, several years ago, a, a researcher, um, I, I mean Eisler, coined this term uh, caring economics, meaning that we would have values about caring for ourselves and others and nature, because that's the framework in which we all work and, and live. And so it, until we are able to integrate elements of those, of, of not just caring for ourselves and our and economic values, but um, again, the environment and our communities, we can't truly get to the point where we will be um, at an area where we can alleviate suffering. So anyway, there. There's groups out there and there's individual researchers and others who think that this idea of caring economics could be an option. And some of the values, as, as we've mentioned, are things like altruism, empathy, compassion, and partnership. And I'm going to talk about a couple of those. Um, I particularly like the idea of partnership because that's where we can see very applied, on the ground, uh, direct results in, in many contexts. I mean, it's, it's harder to say, okay, we're going to be a more empathetic society, but then how do you actually actualize that in some ways? And that becomes very difficult. Whereas things such as partnership can be actualized and, and motive, uh, implemented pretty quickly uh, versus things that are societal changes over time, such as uh, having more compassion and empathy. So there's a couple different sets of, of studies that I just want to quickly review, and, and Ryan, you'll let me know if I, I run over time. It, we looked at things in neuroscience and economic behavior and psychology, and we wanted to really see if, if, if we are truly only the economic actor who only is in the self-interest, or do we have more to us than that as humans? And, and indeed we do. There, there are results that show, particularly uh, Singer is a researcher in that area, and Davidson, that there are elements of empathy and compassion and altruistic behavior related to um, economic motivation. And these studies you know, do everything from hooking people up to the electrodes to monitor what's happening to doing something called functional MRI, which watches the parts of the brain that light up or respond to different stimuli. And those stimuli were about sharing um, economic wealth. I mean, they would give choices about money and compassion about um, economic choices. And indeed, as humans, we have that capability. <laughs> and, and most of us know that. Maybe some of it's been um, buried for a long time, but it's there. And, and so some of the, if you look at the physiological components, that they, they are there and they prove that we have the capacity for it. Now, of course, drawing that out at the scale that we would need uh, to make radical changes across country level is, is another challenge. So another set of findings that we, we looked at um, is that there, there is empathy towards people who are not direct relatives because a lot of studies will have uh, someone's spouse or other relative as part of the test and then, um, then they would put strangers in with people to see if those levels would drop or what would happen. And indeed, there were some changes, but it did show 
that there was still that ability to be compassionate um, across communities, uh, from both small and, and large communities. And it also showed that there were some altruistic behaviors between groups of people, even if those groups were not related, or they were completely different from one's own group, that they could still show those behaviors. And again, most of the, all these studies are conducted usually with something connected to economics, so money choices, sharing money that they're given, that kind of thing. And, um, and also, you know, and, and we found that, or some of the studies have found that lower income groups, um, and, and I wouldn't say unexpectedly, that was one of the edits I took out, show more altruistic behaviors than wealthy groups. And, and that's probably not unexpected at all, and that, that again is one of the things we went back and, and changed. Um, so we're, it's there. I mean, it, it's it's there. We just have to figure out how to take it to scale to make this work more across um, societies. And then the third set of findings, we really looked at how can we adopt these actions, and it, it dealt with training. And in fact, there's been several studies that there's been a two-week period or shorter periods of training for people to learn altruistic behavior. In other words, you know, you can actually change and may help people change. And so they found that they were able to transfer those activities that they learned in their training to the economic um, decision making. And, and that's pretty significant right there, that we know we can change. It's not just the economic assumption that we all act in self-interest and that's just the way it is and it'll never change. Actually, we do have the capacity to change. And, and that's sort of exciting to see that. So I wanted to talk to you about partnership, because to, to me, again, this is the part where we can make a difference and see that connection without waiting for long-term, uh, long time frame social changes. And can, uh, partnerships are other words for things like connection, association, alliance, affiliation, cooperation. We have a lot of names that we, we call it. And um, also, you know, in, even in the workplace, trying to alleviate some of the suffering and improve well-being um, in the corporate world and, and workplace world, regardless of which sector you're working in, can really help the lives of many people. And, and there's many ways that that's been um, done. Um, let me see, check this. Yeah. I, I, one of the slides I added to, to mine is the idea of cooperation, uh, cooperatives, and I wanted to talk just briefly about that, is that the cooperative model in economic systems strives to bring more people into decision making. And by doing that, that tends to enhance fulfillment. And it also in, tends to enhance well-being of the workers who are part of that cooperative. And it's, it, it shows that it doesn't only the benefits convey to those who are directly involved as workers in a cooperative, but to those they serve. That that, that same mentality is, is sort of uh, you know uh, translated forward in terms of the clients, in terms of the customers and others. And so cooperatives are one way that we can track that kind of caring behavior and economic uh, activity is through cooperative uh, development. And that, that holds a lot of potential. And it's interesting to note that despite all the changes we've had in our economic system in the last several decades, where it, it seems like self-interest is, is the primary motivator in many situations, if not direct incivility, <laughs> um, is that cooperatives have enjoyed a resurgence of interest. So, so we had cooperatives a long time ago, and they, they actually have history way back in the guilds of, you know, and middle uh, ages merchant guilds. But anyway, they sort of fell out of favor as we push forward this idea that everything's about the bottom line and we've got to push profits and on and on and on. And then now they're coming back. And so we're seeing a rise of um, the cooperative model, not only in um, developed countries, but developing countries the world over. And there's been uh, literally a resurgence of interest in people wanting to know more, how do they do this, how do they, how do, they do more community-based economic enterprise so that they can be part of that. And um, it's really encouraging to see this. A couple years ago, we had the UN um, year of the co-op. And, and that was very exciting to see what was happening all over the world in this area. In addition to other types of partnerships, there's community-based businesses, which can include cooperative models, as well as very socially-minded and oriented private businesses. And, and that model is also uh, really emerging in some areas as um, alternatives. These are corporations that 
you know, for corp are, are really integrating principles of corporate social responsibility into their business practices. So in other words, they may um, try to source more locally for their inputs. They may um, agree to, to pay certain wages that meet a living standard, and, and on and on. And so that's exciting to see, too. It's, it's not at the, I guess, level or scale that we need to be to say that we uh, successfully now have a caring economy but it is encouraging to see some changes. And then finally, you know, it, it, I don't, there, there's probably no way to replace the existing market-based economic systems entirely. I mean, that would take a revolution of a scale that, that I'm not sure we're quite there yet, but, but who knows what will happen in the next couple of years. But what we can do is integrate more caring attributes. So if we can have options within our systems to be more equitable and just, then we can start alleviating suffering because as we know suffering is directly related to economic systems um, in many many ways and it does impact the social systems as well as our environments natural environments so you know i always like to try to have a positive note in anything i do and so I, we ended our chapter and the presentation with this idea is that we're the ones who created the system this modern economic system for the last really 250 300 years surely we can improve it, and surely we can make those adjustments that can help alleviate suffering at scale that's needed. I mean, we're the ones who did it, surely we can make it better. So with that, I conclude, and um, if I guess we'll wait for questions at the very end, or, or now? Okay, okay, thank you. Time for one or two questions. Yes, But anyway, um, there's a couple of ways. One is that as people learn more that the cooperative